So, uh, first of all, uh, I entered midterm grades for everybody yesterday. You should be able to access them very soon, if not today. Uh, I also used uh, Starfish, which is our uh, kind of tracking system. So some people may have received some positive feedback on Starfish. Some people may have uh, received some messages that I have some concerns. It usually is regarding simply turning in an assignment. Usually by the time it gets turned in, just about all the issues have been ironed out or we can work together to iron them out. <clears throat> so do keep up with the, uh, the work. The work that was included in the midterm assessment, uh, <clears throat> there was an extra credit fact-checking assignment early on. Uh, the radio reader and rap scripts, the story ideas for your original reporting, the radio interview questions that you asked based on your story idea, the radio feature script that you wrote up based on those questions. Moving into video, there's the VOSAD assignment that you did based on the B-roll that I gave you of the Tucson police training exercise. And the TV package script that you wrote, which was an adaptation of the radio feature based on your two original story ideas and your interview questions. And then the midterm exam. So all of that came to 300 points plus whatever you could have made with extra credit. The total of assignments in the class, uh, including the exams and all of it, is 500 points plus whatever extra credit. So looking down the list here, we're more than halfway through the class. Take heart. <laughs> you're almost, you're getting, you're getting done with all of it. And uh, again, if, um, if there are issues with any of the assignments that are keeping you from turning them in, feel free to uh, come and see me during office hours. Uh, again, 11 a.m. to noon in Ardex 170. And uh, we are talking about uh, Tuesday, Thursday. Thank you. And uh, always happy to discuss work with you and other stuff. So uh, we are looking forward now to an assignment that is due November 6th, which is the, the last leg of uh, our, um, oh, there's the grading scale down there if you're wondering what, you know, what came up with what. So uh, there it is. So yes, to continue that thought, we're looking ahead to uh, uh, an assignment which uh, is called the web package assignment due on November 6th. And this involves you adapting your television um, package, which was an adaptation of your radio feature, is <laughs> adapting it into uh, uh, something written to be consumed on the web. So in the next couple of classes, we're going to explore um, what the textbook and uh, uh, other sources recommend about writing for the web. It's quite different than writing for broadcasting, but some of the things that it shares with broadcasting are a more informal type of language, and some of the story structures that we have already discussed are relevant. Uh, and of course, when you do your adaptation, you're going to be taking from your original reporting, which is already done. Um, so the, although I'm, the assignment asks for a lot of little pieces, um, it is going to build on what you've done before and you, you'll find you have a lot of it done already. So I'd say one of the challenges of this assignment is just making sure you've got all the pieces and you understand what the pieces are. Um, and for those present in the room, we've almost talked about it <laughs> already. So, uh, uh, but for those who are uh, studying with us at a distance, it is important to go over all of this. Um, and then uh, there's, of course, the um, textbook chapter as well, which is useful in some ways to, to what we're doing. Um, so let's have a look here. Um, what do we want to do first? Uh, let me just show you what's here on the module. <clears throat> writing on the web. So there's the assignment for the web package. And down here is an example uh, that was done by a student. Um, I'm amazed that it's now uh, four years ago, 2014. And I'm still using this one. 
But I've had lots of good ones since then. But um, uh, this is actually uh, uh, from a student who's now deceased. And I kind of have an affection for the whole um, uh, assignment and his, his contribution to everything here at BMO. It's kind of sad that he um, died uh, at home, just like a heart failure or something. Um, surprising, he wasn't that old. Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> what should we take a look at? Uh, before I dig into the web package, and by the way, those joining us by chat, feel free to say hello, ask any questions and such. Um, and I seem to have to, yeah, you know, I have to renew my chat page. Wow, hi, everybody. Um, OK, well, wow, lots of people here. Fantastic. OK. Um, the web package assignment uh, involves taking your TV package and adapting it for the web. And this is really a, uh, a very common thing that you would um, have to do as a broadcast journalist. Nobody just puts a TV package up online anymore. There's also a rewrite for the web that's done afterwards. So this is something really quite typical. One thing that's nice, it gives us the opportunity to expand on what was already done because we don't have the constraints of TV time, two and a half minutes. Ah, oh, we got to clean it all in. We have, you know, the web has a lot of uh, space on it that we can use. Um, in writing this, we're going to go and use more of a print approach because, you know, a web page is, you know, it's multimedia, but uh, the writing aspect of it really is closer to print than anything else. And yet, we're still using active sentence structure and conversational tone that we would use uh, in our TV package as well. So we can take a lot of the TV package and simply quickly adapt it as the basis for the web um, page that we're going to create. And then we also have the opportunity to add more depth and detail taking advantage of the web's characteristics. So that means there's more space. There's also the ability to put in graphics, more graphics. Uh, we can now do things like use precise numbers instead of rounding everything off. We can use more extensive quotes. We don't need to keep it down to 15 seconds. We can feature more of our uh, SOTs if we want. We can use those as quotes. Um, and we can also use the multimedia aspects of the web and the interactive aspects of the web to our advantage, too. So uh, um, there's a lot we can do with our basic story, drawing on the reporting and the package that you already wrote. Um, so as I said, there's a, a bunch of pieces here um, that I could, you know, that are listed in the prompt. Um, and you know, they include uh, a 50-word summary blurb. In fact, if I just scroll down, we'll see it here. Um, so this is a type of thing that someone would see um, on a home page and would say, oh, that sounds like an interesting uh, story. I want to see that. So the blurb is the written part of that. Um, then there's the news story itself, which is totally adapted from your TV package with some additional information, some additional quotes, some additional uh, context, if you want. Um, it needs to contain at least one multimedia element. Jody, are you able to? Yeah, everything's done. Okay. Awesome. Oh, thanks. Um, let's see. So, uh, contains at least one multimedia element. I suggest a photo. That's really what draws people's attention. Um, using the web writing style that we're going to talk about today in today's class. Um, so, I won't. Uh, belabor that point. Um, write at least one web extra. So we're, we're talking about, we've got the blurb. We got the picture. We've got the main story at 450 words, which is about two pages of writing, double space. Um, and now I'm asking for a short, less than one page, 150 word extra story. So if you wrote about an event, maybe your extra could be a profile of somebody at the event. 
if you wrote a profile, maybe your extra could be, uh, you know, an examination of the broader issue. You know, it's a profile in William's case about somebody who's, you know, both studying and working part time at the same time. Well, a great extra might be, you know, some of the information that we know about how tough it is to study and work at the same time. You know. What percentage of the population is doing this? You know, do they succeed or not? What are some of the things that keep them in the game, et cetera? So it would be kind of the general information which would provide extra context on William's main 450 word story. So that is a web extra. And you really want to think about what your audience might like to know in addition to what you've already written for them. And so then you write this additional extra little story and you don't include it into the main story. It's kind of like an extra that's on side, on the side. That's why I call it a web extra. You know, providing context or personality, a profile. Um, and there are some other options that we could throw out there. But you think what your audience might want to know. And then finally, um, taking advantage of those web interactive features, um, see what you can do or, you know, do <laughs> provide some interactives. Uh, I think the most, the easiest one, the one that most people would do, would be links to relevant websites. So that means, you know, just if you're getting some information for your extra story, you know, add those links in so that people can navigate to um, the actual websites. And for this, you must provide a couple of sentences just to explain what these links are. So that people might say, oh, yeah, I would like to know more about uh, you know, techniques for succeeding in school even while you are working part time. So you know, that's a two-liner that would then have a link, and you would click on the link. Um, so those links could be uh, uh, collected at the end of your story. Uh, minimum of three, um, maybe more if you like. You could also do a survey. So provide some of the questions. You could create discussion forums for your uh, readers. Provide some of the prompts that would keep people discussing. You could do FAQs. So you know, six things that you need to do to keep you know, succeeding in school. And you could do an interactive game or puzzle. And I don't mean that you, this would be playable, but I mean you would give an outline of it. You could do a calendar. If it's a, an event which is unfolded over time, you might want to give us a calendar so that people could um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, orient to the story that way. There may be, uh, you know, a news feed, like an RSS feed or something on particular news topics that you might want to do. And you could also put in an interactive map if you wanted. So all of those are possible, and some of them I will make suggestions as to where you could go on the web to look and find out more about those. So all of this would be turned in not as a web page, because I don't expect you necessarily to have that skill. If you did want to do that, that would be fine, but it's not required. So typically, you would just you know, write it out in an easily navigatable page with you know, 50 word summary, and then write it, and then picture, and then 450 words, and then the web extra, and then the web interactives. So you just Put it one thing after another on a page. So um, as I said, there's an example here from Leland. Um, let me just download it and open it up for you. Um, so this is a PDF. You can look this over at home. And maybe you want to compare it to the prompt. Um, so <clears throat> Leland's topic was um, an event. Uh, the farmer's market near where he lives. Uh, he first off, you know, proposed the story idea, created questions, went and interviewed the organizer of the, uh, of the organic uh, um, farmer's market near him. Uh, and then when he wanted to uh, bring in a second source, he actually went to Whole Foods to kind of show the corporate side of this organic food trend. Um, and so he wound up talking to a product manager at Whole Foods as well. And that was, uh, brings us up to where he was at in his TV package. Uh, and here he has now adapted the TV package for the web uh, package, um, which he did do as a WordPress blog because he knew how to do it, but you don't have to. You could also just mimic what uh, 
the structure that he's used here is absolutely fine. So as you notice, the first thing up is the blurb around 50 words. Consumers are eating up the concept of organics. Everything that the organic food aura envelops is attracting shoppers in droves. Once a small niche, the industry is growing and small farmers and markets could be left behind. Okay, so that's a really great angle. Because remember, all this began at just, hey, it's fun to go to this market. Let's, you know, enjoy a farmer's market. And, you know, after he's thought about it for a couple of months and written a couple of different versions of it, he now has some really interesting ideas based on, you know, small distribution like in a farmer's market versus big distribution like Whole Foods owned by Amazon and what that does to the small farmers and stuff. So um, he's really learned a lot. And so that's a, that's a very, you know, it's, it's just a really good assignment. Um, but I'm showing this to you just to show you that he's got all the pieces. Um, here are his interactives where he's got related links. So he's got different links to news and information uh, about all of this stuff, including the Stonestown Farmer's Market, which is what he began with. Uh, remember, he needs to have at least one multimedia element, a photograph. So he's got a bunch of photographs in here. You only need one. Um, he copied them from the internet, but he also shot a whole bunch of pictures himself. Um, so either way is fine. We're not looking for totally originality stuff. How would you minimize the pictures we did? Oh, you don't need to make it fit. He, you know, he kind of, um, he, uh, he organized it again because he likes layout and I mean he used to work on the magazine here at City College too but you could just um, if you're doing a word document on this and uh, uh, there it goes I was just going to show you you just insert a picture in a word document or in a Google Doc okay. and you're fine put it up at the top right. and uh, and that's your your element um, so those are his interactives which are all links uh, he also decided he was going to do um, a map, which is cool, uh, but you don't have to. All you need to do is that one. So if we're in Word, hello Word, open it up please. Uh, keep going this away. Uh, we'll get back to that. So this is uh, Leland's 450 word story adapted from his TV package. Um, there's a lot that's good here. Uh, the format that I'm uh, encouraging you to do uh, short paragraphs, a couple of sentences on average. Uh, set them apart with a line break. So give people lots of space around these short paragraphs. Um, where you had an SOT, uh, put quotations around it and use it as a quote. Uh, so he's got a couple of SOTs in there. Break your text up with a lot of subheadings. So don't just put it all in one massive 450 word thing. Give people subheadings so they can navigate around your story and know what's being said, okay? So this is um, quite different than a term paper. Uh, comes to 450 words in his case, and that's the end there. Um, and now he's included his 150 word web extra so this is that little related story as you see it doesn't even make a full page it's written in the same sort of format as the rest but what's different here is i mean basically he did a story about a farmer's market and the impact of big big companies like whole foods and what that does to you know uh the organic food business and so in order to do something related, but a little different, he did a profile of these two um, Fiddler's Green Farm owners who are often at the event. And, uh, you know, just to, to personalize it. Because part of what you lose when you go to Whole Foods is you lose any contact with, you know, the grower, the provider. Uh, you yes? Description? Pardon me? I noticed a description. Uh, caption here? Yeah. Yeah. He felt like doing it. That's oh, his own picture. Oh, yeah. Awesome. That's optional. Yeah. Only one photo is necessary. Okay. 
Now he's included uh, uh, works cited, and you don't have to because this is not a term paper. Um, so you should be doing attribution as you write, you know, basically. But <clears throat> one thing that is important is that um, the information, look at this here, because, you know, there is uh, an intellectual honesty thing nonetheless here, which is stories by Leland Yi, absolutely, but he lists the source from the Cape Valley Farm Shop newsletter. So this is where he got the information about these two guys that he met already. So, you know, uh, you don't put a work cited, but um, I do want to know where things came from, your source. So typically you can put it in your byline at the top of a story. Okay, because this is a print story. So we'll get to those byline things. Okay, so um, just keep checking it out, see if anybody's got any questions or comments. No? Okay, cool. So again, I felt that uh, last class people were going, oh my God, this is like so huge, but it's really not huge. Uh, especially when you consider that what you're doing is an adaptation. And this is something you would do if you were working as a broadcast journalist. You know, uh, once you bring back your material and get your package all edited um, and up for the 6 o'clock news or the 10 o'clock news, I, usually the reporter themselves, but sometimes um, somebody who's working in the digital part of the, of the station will do a web story based on um, the, uh, the, the, the TV package. So we can look at an example of that. If we go to NBC Investigates, which is our San Jose affiliate. So uh, <clears throat> they brand themselves as the investigative unit. What this translates to is longer packages than you'll find on Cron or KTVU. So sometimes their packages will range up to five or seven minutes. Uh, with more data in them, more and and you know just uh, they're they're trying to break news uh, over maybe a three-day cycle rather than you know doing uh, every day the day's story. So they have larger teams that they take more time producing stuff, and there's more kind of polished graphics involved. So uh, we can look at one of these as a package and then see, see it as a web page, too, because they do what everybody does now, basically. So um, uh, I avoided the sex scandal stories because I'm just not in the mood for all that. But uh, let's see here. Um, Jessica, exactly right. Experts tell us these percolation ponds now threaten some parts of California's future water supply. We found hundreds of these ponds all over California. In some cases, the toxins are migrating and have reached once clean underground water. This is where the pond, where the pipe goes out to the pond. Second generation farmer Fred Starr showed us where the threat to his family's way of life, percolation ponds like these, sat running 24 hours a day. And the ponds extended all the way down, all the way down for a while. The now fallow grassland sits within sight of Starr's almond trees. We've had enough. Starr and his family sued the pond's owner, Era Energy, an oil and gas company owned by ExxonMobil and Shell. The lawsuit claimed wastewater from the ponds migrated underground and contaminated groundwater under the Starr's land. We are not able to pull up water to irrigate our crop, which, which we are desperately short of all the time. You have this resource that you can never replace. Larry Starr, his friend's son. It was like, man, this isn't right. It was a intentional polluting, and they knew that. In California, oil is brought up from deep underground by injecting millions of gallons of water into wells. When that mixture comes back to the surface, the wastewater contains chemicals that are toxic to humans. Proponents of this pond disposal method say the soil and bacteria at the bottom of the ponds filter out the toxins, and that does happen. But new evidence from the local water quality control board shows that not all the toxins are filtered every time. It is increasingly likely that these pits can contaminate groundwater. 
Seth Shonkoff is executive director at PSE Healthy Energy and visiting scholar at UC Berkeley's Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management. Shonkoff believes these pits threaten water supplies that California may depend on during droughts. It sets us up for a future where we are going to be less certain that people will not be exposed to hazardous chemicals in their water supply. That kind of uncertainty keeps me up at night. Astonishingly, California is the only oil producing state that allows this reckless practice. Holland Kretzman with the Center for Biological Diversity is not overstating that fact. We checked him out. No other oil producing state, not Texas, not North Dakota, not Montana, allows open percolation ponds like these. Those states get rid of their oil wastewater in different ways. It's very concerning that the contamination is spreading underground to groundwater, and we don't know the true extent of that contamination. Take these ponds as one example of what can happen. They are the McKittrick ponds in the Central Valley at their peak, dumping up to 4.8 million gallons of wastewater here every day. A staff report from Central Valley Water Board shows the plume of toxic water underneath these ponds has already spread underground more than two miles away. And the fact that the Central Valley Water Board hasn't taken any meaningful action yet is just unacceptable. Uh, this is an inexcusable practice. And there's no reason why we should let it continue. I mean, to be totally honest, uh, the regulatory agencies were a bit behind the curve. Patrick Palupa is incoming executive officer at Central Valley's Regional Water Quality Control Board. Is there a risk to groundwater from these ponds? I think we wouldn't be having this conversation if there wasn't a risk. The Water Board oversees many of the more than 1,000 active percolation ponds located throughout the state. Some scientists say in some instances where there was good quality water, it's too late. I think it's really tough to remediate the groundwater once it's impacted. You would concede there may be some instances where that's happened? Absolutely. I think there may be some instances. I don't think that's the majority of the cases out there. Uh, would I like to see more action on this earlier? Um, certainly. Because of that, Palupa says his board is now taking action. I think we're, we're adopting a robust regulatory program right now to make sure that those ponds are regulated. Palupa points out that in some cases, the groundwater below the ponds is of such poor quality to begin with, it doesn't matter what goes down through the ground. But the Starr family says they used to have good clean water under their land. I really do blame our regional water board for a lot of it because they have the power to shut them down, they have the power to stop it, and they didn't do any of that. Era Energy sent us a statement that reads in part, quote, after years of litigation and three jury trials, there was never a finding linking Era's operations to damage to tree crops or harmed drinking water resources. But the jury's verdict from the first trial contradicts that, concluding that the oil wastewater did in fact pollute the star's groundwater. After 13 years of appeals, the stars ended up settling for an undisclosed amount of money. Do you feel vindicated? Not at all. No way you're vindicated. They say they're not vindicated because the groundwater under their land is lost, polluted forever, and unusable. Because of that, the stars feel as if they lost much more than they won. Like there's a pond that's still out there, it's not even a mile off of our property, that's still polluting as we sit here today. Now the stars now have to bring their water in from other sources outside their land to water their crops. Another oil company we spoke to told us they reuse much of their wastewater for oil recovery and that they inject much of that waste deep into the ground so that it does not contaminate any water supply. Although that method is much more costly and that's what it's all about. Money. It's real cheap to just dump it in the ground. And a lot happening. Yeah, a lot happening in our Central Valley, but a lot more people are starting to focus Absolutely. On. And this could impact us the next drought. Okay, thank you. Do that. Thank you, Stephen. Yep. Hey. So what did you think about that story, first of all? Any thoughts? <laughs> or not? <laughs> going to be difficult having healthy, clean water. Mm. Yeah. When yeah, true. They brought in that's like a lot of different that's... sources to cite their argument. Yeah, yeah, that's that's characteristic of their investigative approach, right? So it was longer, was six minutes long, uh, which is, you know, we've been working with two and a half minutes, which is definitely the standard for local news. 
but as we said, they brand themselves as investigative, so they do more in-depth pieces. So I was just trying to keep track of some of the elements for a little comparison that we're going to do in a sec. But what we can see is, you know, I mean, this dive's pretty deep. You have to be careful when you're doing a longer piece like this that you don't overwhelm the listener, the viewer, with, you know, too much information that they can't process. Uh, you also need a lot of B-roll. You need, you know, I saw those drone shots of those, you know, McKittrick ponds about 30 times. Um, it's tough to do B-roll when you're talking about a lawsuit or a jury decision or stuff like that. So graphics are done, you know, uh, especially the first one, we had a superimposition of these pipes spewing water and, uh, and, and a document, right? So you got to try to make visually as interesting as you can when you're talking about such documents. Um, <clears throat> so these are some of the challenges of, let's say, doing a, an investigative longer piece as a TV package. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, it's far more substantial than um, what we've typically been getting as, uh, yeah, okay, Fran mentions it was long, yeah, six minutes. It's, it's much longer than, uh, than we usually have, absolutely. Uh, and there were those extra, extra visual aspects to it. All right, so uh, after they broadcast the package, uh, they also have it available as a, uh, a web package. So let's just take a look at what they do with it. Now this will vary from one uh, uh, news organization to another. Um, <clears throat> NBC Investigative tends to start out with almost a summary lead at, at the beginning of the story. So um, scientists fear that California's water supply is under threat by a practice that has been banned in every major oil production state. California allows oil companies to dump millions of gallons of wastewater into open, unlined pits across the state. Uh, investigative reporter Stephen Stock reports. So that's almost like the anchor's introduction, you know, just put up there. And then we begin the package. Um, and as you can see, uh, some, of the, some of the video as well, now we're working with still images. Uh, we do start off with the Stars family. So we did also in the TV package. Um, <clears throat> even, you'll recognize even some of the, uh, of the SOTs have just been turned into quotes, right? They had a 12 inch pipe that was running water continuously, this black oily water, he said. And Star said they had a mile of ponds. So as you can see, part, what they've done is they pretty much followed what they had in the TV package, except they're writing it up into um, short paragraphs that are um, you know, written out basically in print style. Okay, so we've got still pictures. What do you notice about the paragraphs? Short. They're very short, a couple of sentences. When you are using an SOT or a quote, it basically becomes a separate paragraph of its own. You're having to put things in like Fred Starr added, right? We didn't do that. In our TV package, that would have been an error, right? We don't want to comment on the picture as well as watch the picture. But in this case, when we're pulling out an SOT and turning it into a quote, we need to say who actually said it. So you're doing a lot of that kind of conversion, pulling out your SOTs and putting in Fred Starr said this, something blah, 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 said Fred's son, Larry. It was like, and so on. Man, this isn't right. It was intentional polluting. They knew that. So we, we saw him actually say it. So now it's written up, basically uh, transposed. Uh, <clears throat> at this point, there's a little deviation. We, in the print story, we go, or the web story, we go to their lawyer, Ralph Weegis, and uh, he talks more about what they went through. Um, they sued Aetna Energy, which was polluting their groundwater. And of course, we did see Aetna respond in the, bigger, in the, in the television story. Um, we go through it here. We next mention the CVRWQCB, uh, which is a very long thing for the water board somewhere. 
Uh, so um, the SOT there was from somebody named Palupa. And so it's the Water Quality Control Board. Oh, there they are, Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, so we hear from the, them again and Executive o Officer Patrick Palupa. Because this is the web, we have the time and the detail that we can actually include a map, right? Which is pretty cool. So, you know, again, this is of maybe minor interest to us up here consuming this in Bay Area. But, you know, to people local there, it's much more interesting. And just think of this as an opportunity, something that you could do yourself. As I mentioned, a student in this class did a map like this uh, when he wrote about um, disappearing venues for live music in San Francisco and stuff. So there's a great interactive feature that is introduced there. Um, then we get the experts giving their point of view. Uh, so Shankoff, who's the Berkeley scholar, talking about how dangerous this is. Uh, it's very conserving that the, oh, that's Kretzmann. So Kretzmann came in immediately afterwards. Um, so uh, again, you know, we're pretty much just adapting it. And uh, here we've added some extra information in just one series of ponds, McKittrick. Uh, we're hearing 4.8 million gallons of wastewater per day is being uh, dumped into these uh, ponds like this. Polluted water has migrated underground 2.2 miles from the wastewater ponds. So we've got more data, more detail, more depth, which is being included here. And you know we've got, because this is the web, we can link to documents, right? So there's the report. Now, why would we be interested in linking to documents in a, in a story like this? What does it do to give us access to these? Uh, provides credibility. Yeah, I would agree, William. I would not expect too many people from, you know, the public to want to actually read that report. But the fact that it's there gives a lot of credibility. Absolutely. And uh, I believe lower down in this story, they've got a link to the jury verdict uh, when ERA Energy basically, um, you know, uh, was, uh, was prosecuted by the stars and such. So there's Palupa. Uh, so Palupa, remember, he's the newly appointed official at the Water Quality Board. And, uh, you know, so the bad acts didn't happen on his watch, uh, but he's saying they weren't great and they're going to try and clean up and such and such. So his part of the story is, you know, typically we've got the plaintiffs, the people who got some problems, Aetna would not talk to us, so we just got a few kind of logos going by of Aetna and that owns, owned by ExxonMobil. You remember in the, in the TV package, they went by. Uh, but then ultimately we get, um, we, we have to go to the water quality board that let this happen. Uh, and uh, so we hear more from them, right? And then finally, uh, in typical Diamond style, we end up back with the stars who just basically say, you know, even though we won, our water is polluted and uh, we, can't, we can't change that. It's such a huge problem. There's no way to fix that. So, um, so that's the story. And as we can see, that's how it was adapted for the web. And now it's a long story, so the web version is pretty long. But um, you would be doing some of the same things um, in your web adaptation of your story, definitely. So this is how it works in the, in the real world, in the, in the broadcast world. OK, no more comments there. Huh. All right. So let's focus in on a, uh, for a second on, um, not on Leland's work, but on some of the tips that I wanted to give you about writing for the web web writing style, uh, which is in the textbook chapter six, which, uh, you know, rather than get into those endless PowerPoints again, let's just take a look at some of these things, okay? So um, web writing style, one or two sentences in paragraphs, and split stuff up into subsections, 
with bold and easy to understand headlines. That means you may only have two or three short paragraphs or maybe four and then you do a subhead. So you're going to be doing lots of subheads. Um, and there's a reason for that, which relates to how people actually um, consume stories on the web. So there's some really interesting research done on this, um, <clears throat> which takes a look at people as they actually read stuff. Uh, I think this is, yeah, here we go. Um, <clears throat> so this is expensive research to do. There's not a ton of it out there, but this one is from the BBC in England. And so what this is is you put on these glasses with little cameras that are pointed at your eyeballs. And you can see through the glasses, but the cameras are, are looking at your eyes as you read. And then um, you, they have person after person after person navigate through websites and see how they actually read what's there. So um, in this case, they're, it's a BBC science story. And they do this for mobile now, too, which is pretty interesting. So um, here's somebody looking through a page. So the red dot uh, is their focus. OK, so first they went and searched, and they found some stuff. Um, so readers tend to uh, look through bolded stuff, and they go to blocks they go to blocks very often on the middle or the right-hand side of the page, which is interesting because when they start reading, they actually go to the left. So you can see, you know, the person here is looking around for something that interests them. They're reading in a pretty linear way now, right? They're going left and right. Most popular. Oh, we decided we like that story about octopuses that actually live inside of coconut shells. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So visual elements like uh, uh, photos and especially videos are very attractive. So here they got bored waiting for the ad to play because they can't skip the ad. So they dropped down and started actually reading the story. Notice the story has a lot. Ah, OK, video is going to play. They're back up to the video. So they're watching this. Pretty amazing, but also kind of gross. So it's an octopus that basically uh, grabs a coconut shell as a place to live in, <laughs> to hide out in. <laughs> and he moves it around with him when he goes. Pretty amazing. How long is this video? <laughs> OK. Yeah, no, what I mean is that's what, that's what the guy just looked at. It's like 148. OK. Still pretty interested in the video. OK, now what is this? Oh my god, look at this. The octopus actually gets inside the shell, hides out. It's kind of long. It's pretty amazing, huh? Oops, wakey wakey. <laughs> Whoop, OK. We figured there's nothing much else in the last 20 seconds. We're down. So the reader is, this is a quite a linear reader, right? It read the first paragraph, jumped down to the second. So this is why you're giving them subheadings, so that they can you know, stay oriented, so they know where they're going and what they've read. So this is a linear reader, definitely rereading a little bit there. And now checking out the picture. Uh, oops, there was a nonlinear jump, but now, OK, back up here. So this is the kind of reader that makes your job worthwhile. You know, you figure you, you put stuff on the web, you think, do, does anybody actually read this? I mean, or do they just skim through it or something? But this is a reader who's actually, you know, 
reading the whole thing, not skimming. About 50% of your readers will read in a linear way, and the other 50% will jump around, skim, and maybe only read certain content that they find interesting. Everybody is drawn to pictures, which is why we're putting at least one picture in our, um, in our web package. Definitely. Uh, now notice the subheads, surprisingly smart. They are short, they are bold, they are informative. It's not cute, it's not little Ali octopus is so, you know, it is surprisingly smart. Yes, octopuses are intelligent. They're gross and they're intelligent. So, you know, that's the, you're, you're trying to make your subheadings informative so that people um, know if they want to spend time reading that section or not. If, if they, they, they may just jump down to the a lower section if they're not interested in what you've written there. Uh, so you want to make your headings really useful to them. Okay, so uh, that's sort of proof positive of um, how people actually read stuff on the web. <clears throat> and based on that, we're very scientific here. I know we don't always appeal that way, or, or appear to be that scientific. But based on that, uh, where is it, darn? Yeah, again, what I'm asking you to do is write in very short paragraphs, one or two sentences, and uh, split into subsections with bold, easy to understand headlines, nothing too cute, nothing too... Conversational language, so you know, you can keep the conversational language from the TV package, that's, that's very useful. Active verbs, short sentences, no spelling or grammar mistakes, especially that will turn people off and will discredit the quality of your information. You know, if, it's, if, if your site is full of mistakes and stuff like that, they'll say, well, how do you guys know about octopuses living in coconuts, right? This is BS, right? But if it's nice and clear, and of course, if you bear the BBC brand, then you're really in good sh shape. No spelling or grammar mistakes. Links at the bottom of the story to additional web resources. Um, what we saw in the NVC investigative piece was links throughout the piece, and you can do that, but it makes it easier for me to uh, grade if I see the links at the bottom of the story to additional web resources, right? And so those are, uh, would be considered some of the web interactive features that I asked for, so links to relevant websites. So do you guys have any questions while we're, we're you know, just this partly part way through this? Okay, terrific. Um, if I go back to here. <clears throat> Remember I asked you for a summary blurb, like 50 words. So this is, for instance, where the summary blurb would be useful. And uh, um, so this is on the home page or the video page. As you saw, people come to these pages and they scan through and say, well, what am I interested in? You know, uh, I, you know if, I'm, if I'm ecologically right, addicted to porn, number one, I wasn't interested in that. Uh, a look at how FBI analysts examine suspicious devices, that might be interesting. Inmate tells her story of sexual abuse. No, thank you. Toxic wastewater. So, you know, that's what interested me. So I went to that. And um, when you click through, wherever you click through, you can. That's okay, exactly why right. experts tell us these percolation. So we're back to what we already looked at. Uh, so they don't do the subheadings. They're bad. I don't think that's good. And they get to two longer paragraphs than I asked for. So, you know, I kind of like, I like the BBC uh, um, approach there in, in that as far as an example. They had better subheadings, they had um, uh, shorter paragraphs and such. So, anyhow, um, I think, so Katerina tells us, I think that writing for the web allows you to use more elaborate language, that's true, as people can easily look up unknown words, VS and radio and TV are often used in the background. That octopus video made my day. The reader is very involved in the article. The reader truly is involved in the article. As I said, we're lucky when we get a reader like that who 
reads in a linear fashion everything be from beginning to end. Uh, and is watching your video almost the whole way through. So um, anyhow, uh, interesting proof there for why it's important to use the web writing style. OK? So that's, um, those are important considerations for re rewriting uh, this next material. You know? Yeah. So writing for the web, in many ways, brings us back to uh, writing for traditional print style. Uh, it's true with the interactive features. Um, things do, whoops, I'll zoom out a little bit. Um, so a few things that are useful to us from this chapter, which everything about our textbook is not exactly like adapted to what I want to do with it. It's close enough. Just a reminder then of uh, story structures that we typically find, right? So broadcasting is very often of the diamond structure. And uh, print is the inverted pyramid. And so. Um, in doing your rewrites, um, consider it may be necessary to move back to the inverted pyramid. Uh, I don't think there's such a huge difference in everybody's story. And as you saw with NBC Investigative, they kept basically the diamond structure uh, in a sense that the, uh, <clears throat> the TV package began with the stars the family, the farmers, and it ended with the stars. And then, you know, the broader context of the story was just basically California's lax rules about this and, you know, the environmental costs of letting them dump that sort of fracking water into uh, open pits. Um, when they turned it into a web package, remember underneath the um, the image was pretty much a summary lead as you would find in any print story, and then basically it narrowed down. You got then then they reproduced the diamond in there, so they did a summary lead, but they kept the diamond structure. So um, I think it, it works absolutely fine. Uh, but I would say that when writing for the web, make sure you include a summary lead. Like start off with the facts. Just because, again, your readers will read the beginning of any story. And the beginning of the story is also going to be higher rated in search engine optimizations and stuff. So you do want to have the summary facts at the start. If you bury them further down in the story, those scanners and those nonlinear readers who are about half of your reading public, they may not get the key information early enough to decide to stick with you. So uh, at least get a summary lead in there. Um, after that, uh, you know, the, um, the rest of this chapter deals with um, quotes direct quotes, indirect quotes, managing that stuff in, in your writing for print. Um, so let's take a look on that. Print writing relies heavily on the inverted pyramid structure. You're going to use shorter paragraphs. And you want to demonstrate objectivity, which we've been counseling throughout this class. But um, again, you know, try to keep overt opinionating out of it. Um, instead, you're, you're trying to be factual about it if you can. Uh, again, even in your profile, you, you know, this may be your best friend, but you're trying not to say, well, this is just a wonderful person. You're trying to demonstrate what it is that they do that's so great. Um, so your SOTs are going to be uh, quotes right away. So you know, I have a little recipe for you next class about how to, um, you know, just take your, take your TV package and, you know, transform it as quickly as you can into a web package. 
But certainly a big part of that is to take your SOTs that were, you know, sound bites and turn them into quotes. Uh, and you may even want to go and add some more quotes from the interview that you did already or from your second, the second person that you talked to or the second source that you talked to. So uh, now is a chance to put in more quotes. And uh, um, direct quotes are what you got in your interview and you put them in word for word and you put quotation marks around them and they're accurate. Although it is permissible to remove ums and ahs and all those things, you know, typically we don't write those in when we uh, do direct quotes. So, you know, uh, cut that out. But otherwise, word for word, you want to do it. Um, indirect quotes are paraphrases. And so <clears throat> a lot of your, um, you know, a lot, a lot of your interview was based on gathering information. Uh, and you use that in paraphrase form. People tell you stuff, you put it into your own words, and you say it uh, as accurately as you can. Um, and you also you know, build up your sense of what the reality of the story is from various sources that you will paraphrase. So a good part of the writing that is not direct quotes are paraphrases. And then partial quotes may mix part of one and the other. And partial quotes are very useful because in print, unlike in television, you can sandwich together uh, parts of a, of a, of a soundbite that came maybe a minute apart. So you're able to you know, assemble things together uh, by you know, start with part of a soundbite from you know, minute 10 of the interview. So, you know, uh, the water here is getting super polluted. And then you could write, says Larry Starr, you know. And then um, we decided we have to take them to court. And that may have come from minute 15 of the interview. But you can tie those together in a way that you really couldn't do in uh, television. So this is a nice aspect of writing for the web. Structurally. Um, as I say, you really want to make sure that in the first paragraph or two of your web story, you get the summary lead in there, enough information to keep them interested in the story. Because they're definitely going to read that. After that, who knows where else they're going to go. So we've talked about leads. We've talked about all that stuff. We don't need to go through that again. Paraphrase quote pairing. So once you're in the middle of your story, in most of these cases, you're going to have a kind of direct quote, like Larry says something, Larry star. And then you're going to paraphrase some additional information and move on to another quote. So this is just the basics of print writing. I don't think we need to go too far more onto that. At the end of a story, remember, and I've been counseling you on this regarding your television packages already. But uh, just a reminder that uh, um, it's equally important in web writing for the web to look forward and anticipate what is coming next. Um, so uh, at the end of your story, like what's the next development we can expect coming out of this story? In addition, when writing for the web, there's an expectation that people are going to be reading the latest information, um, the most important stuff. So uh, the entire story should be written uh, without any kind of time markers in the sense that today, tomorrow, we expect. So yeah, we want to hear what the next step is. Uh, you know, but you don't want to say the stars are waiting for a civil case to uh, be tried on uh, November 30, 13th, uh, because you want this to stay up there and seem to be the most um, recent version of the story. If you put in specific dates like that, they are going to, uh, um, you know, the story will get old. And people go to the web for the latest information. So uh, look forward, but don't give any specific markers that will date your story. If it's already happened when you post, that's cool. You know, 
the stars won their suit uh, on August 30th, that's all right at the end of the summer or whatever. But when looking forward, don't be specific about dates and times because readers expect to have exactly um, what, what they, uh, the, the latest information. William? Um, in my, uh, in regards to my personal um, assignment for, for here, uh, I have one section where I talk about the, uh, the conclusion of my uh, profile's uh, involvement in a particular program. Mm. Uh, um, should I include a specific date in that way? Well, you could, like, I don't know, she expects to graduate in, yeah. you know, 2020 or something. That's cool. Okay. That's all right. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's so far ahead that it's not going to go out of date for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so at the end of a story, typically there's, you know, what can we expect next? Or, you know, an encapsulating quote, you know, in the story that we looked at for NBC Investigative, they went back to the stars and they said, okay, you guys won. Are you happy? And they said, well, we won, yeah, but nothing's going to replace our groundwater, which is contaminated, you know, and we can't fix that. So in a sense, that is, you know, the summary of the piece. Yeah, you won, but this environmental damage has been done, right? So relying on sources, make sure you've got as much of your quotes now as are, are you know, as are really informative and useful. You know, before you had to uh, restrict everything for the TV package, but now you have the opportunity to stretch out, use more quotes from your interviews. Um, so that's good. And I don't know what flavor with care means. I'm going to have to email the author. Uh, I don't know. So, so that's, you know, that's the, the basic advice that, uh, that we got from the textbook. And it's, uh, you know, in relation to, uh, to our stories. Stuff out. Well, things seem to be sort of quiet in chat. It's definitely very quiet here in class. Uh, so anybody who uh, is, <laughs> we always appreciate having more company in class. Um, so come on in if you can. Uh, otherwise, that's it for today. We'll see you all Thursday. And I'll have some recipes for you about uh, easy ways to transform your package into, you know, the skeleton of a, a, your web package. So transforming the TV script into the web package. We'll focus in more on that, the mechanics of it. Because there are some easy ways to do this. All right. See you Thursday.